you open your Bibles to the Acts of the Apostles, and we're going to start in at, at chapter 6, the Acts of the Apostles. We're going to uh, look at a several uh, places there, but while you're getting them there to Acts, you know, as I said on the first day, from the time that uh, we close our uh, conference every year, uh, we begin to look at the evaluation and, and we take the evaluation serious. So we want you to do your evaluation of this conference because we want to use that to improve what we are doing here. The idea of creating this association was to bring people together who had a sort of a holistic view of ministry, who understood that holism was a whole people taking a whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world. And that we wanted to bring those people, especially those who was already out there, who was concerned about the whole person, who was out there at the cutting edge of society, bring them together where we could learn from each other and then we could inspire the development of other ministries like ours, both here in America, but also around the world. And this is an association. This is not an organization. This is a place where equals come together to learn from each other and to grow together. Sometimes when I try to explain the association, people will say to me, because they're so used to organizations coming into being, to promise them what they're going to do for them. We have made our whole society too dependent on somebody else to do something for us and we are not utilizing the resources that we have to carry this gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. And so we got an association, and we are here to learn from each other. We are here not to fault each other or blame each other, but we want to hear each other and listen to each other so we can learn from each other. The one of the good things, we who are on the cutting edge of American society, sometimes you will hear it must sound like that we are almost sometimes anti-American. We are not. There have been some good things about this nation. There have been some bad things about it, like slavery is one of the most wicked things, segregation and discrimination, and the very fact that the church accommodated that kind of stuff is a disgrace to us. But there are some good things about America. And one of the good things that have made this nation great have been its volunteer association. At the volunteer association level, everybody comes together and share their resources how to develop their product a little better. It seems like McDonald's and Winners is in competition when they're out there in the streets, on the streets, selling their hamburgers. But there is a hamburger making association. And at that association meeting, Wendy and McDonald all come together and learn how to do their trade much better in the society. That's what this association is all about. We're about equals coming together to learn from each other and then go back to our community and then we will know each other too. And that we can call on the people that we hear about here who know how to do it a little better than we know how to do it. And it will get them to come and help us and we'll grow together. That's what this association is all about. I said all of that to say, even in this association, we want to make certain that everything that we do is anchored in the Word of God. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God that got to be the driving force in what we are doing. And we believe that community development is really trying to live in obedience to the Word of God, to the Word of God. And, and so that's why we are here. And we have selected three uh, topics, basically. Uh, we've already talked about uh, integrity. And we talked about uh, the very fact that Joseph was a person in the Bible who we use as our model of integrity and how that he was a fulfillment of the first song. He was like a tree planted by the river water that brought forth fruit in the season. His leaves didn't wither and whatsoever he got into, he prospered. We talked about that the other day. And now, yesterday, we talked about vulnerability. And we used one of my heroes in the Bible who exposed himself. And he exposed himself to the king, he exposed himself to Jezebel, 
because he fell in love with God. We said that he would have been an ordinary guy. That's what James says, say that Elijah was an ordinary guy, just like you and me. But somewhere along the line, this man fell in love with God. And that's what it means to really be a Christian. To be a Christian is to, is to discover that God loves you. The best place to discover that is at the cross. It's at the cross we see God's love. The just dying for the unjust. Greater love than no one than this. The woman laid down his life for his friend. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We discover how much God loves us. And that we repent in the relationship to our rebellions against this God who have been after us with love. And we discover that he's after us with his love. And then we repent because we've been so rebellious to this God. Then we turn back to this God and he saves us. We forg forgives our sin and he saves us. Now we're in love with this God. And now what we want to do is to love others, to try to love others the way that we have been loved. That was Jesus' teaching. He had been eternally loved by the Father. And because he had been loved by the Father, he loved those 12 disciples like he had been loved by the Father. And that's our responsibility, is to love God. That's our privilege, to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind. And then we have to reach that love out to our neighbors, to our neighbors as we love ourselves. This morning, we want to talk about brokenness, what it means to be broke. I, I really believe that in order to be an effective Christian, let's put it this way, uh, one need to come to that place in their life when they are broken, when they are broken. They need to come to that place where they have to depend upon God. Abraham became the father of our faith. And what made Abraham the father of our faith, God called him to go out and live among some Canaanites, some wild people. He put him in a situation where he had to trust God. And what God said to him every time he was threatened, he would say, Abraham, walk before me and be sincere. I'm your shield. I'm your buckle. I will take care of you. And in the midst of that, Abraham walked out in that. And he watched God take care of him. He didn't trust in himself. He had to trust in God. You know, what we have organized, and I've said that, we have organized Christianity today, more or less, is becoming an extension of individualism, selfish, and greed. What we need is God to help us. And a lot of this so-called healing, a lot of all this prosperity Christianity, is all getting God to help us. Getting God to do stuff for us. God has done what is necessary for us. God has provided redemption in Jesus Christ. And he has provided everything that pertains unto life and holiness and godliness. All we have to do is to live in obedience to that, and God will freely give us that. And then to create a religion of culture, of prosperity, and God blessing me and naming and claiming is destroying our society. It's setting our society up for the lottery. It's setting our society up for a big fall. God wants us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. He said, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, we just getting Jesus to help us get along. And we need to be utilizing these resources we have to get this wonderful gospel out to the end of the world. These are the last words of Jesus. Jesus told us to carry this gospel to the end of the world. Take his love to the end of the world. And the church has become just a survivor church. A self-seeking church. When our resources should be used to get out this precious gospel of Jesus Christ. To enrich our world. To enrich our world with our skills. To give our lives away to others and to watch God bless us, to watch God bless us as we, walk, we, as we go in obedience to him. And so this morning, we want to look at one that was broken. But what came out of that brokenness is the gospel to the Gentiles. Let's look at it this morning as we go to look at this Paul this morning. Beginning in verse, uh, in verse uh, 
chapter 6. Let's read a verse there in chapter 6. And let me just read it here for you. Chapter 6, uh, uh, here, where am I at in chapter 6? The chapter 6 I want to set in at this morning. Make sure it's chapter 6. Uh, well, let me get my notes so that'll make it even better. Chapter 7, we're going to start. It's chapter 7, verse 50. Chapter 7, verse 57. It's where you want to start. Let's, if you got your Bibles open there, let's listen to this. This is at the stoning of Stephen, the first deacon. We're finna set you up for this apostle Paul. We're finna set you up here to see how God broke him. Look what it says here. And casting him out of the city, that's Stephen, they stoned him. And the witnesses, the people who did the stoning, cast down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he called upon the Lord. And Stephen, even in his dying, he says, lay not this, this evil to their charge. And so they laid their garments down at a little man at a guy's feet named Saul. He then, this self righteous Jewish Pharisee bigot, went mad. He went like a hound dog. It pleased him. He was a zealous. He wanted to erase all traces of Gentile influence upon the Jewish religion. You see, Stephen had been a, a proselyte Jew, and he had confronted the Sahedrin with the idea that God has always had a love for all people of the world. But he created the Jewish nation for a special purpose. And that Jewish nation was to be the group of people that he called out who would maintain his truth until the seed could come. And he was going to bring the Son of God into the world by this nation that he created. He made this nation. He took Abraham, who was an Assyrian, and he called him out, put him out there among the Canaanites, and preserved him. And then he called him down into Egypt. And in Egypt, he made them a nation in Egypt. Then he showed his power by bringing them out of Egypt and protecting them for 40 years out in the wilderness. And then he put them into that land. He had a purpose for that. And that purpose was that one day the Son of God would come through that people. And so God made that. And so Stephen explained that. Have you read the Stevenson sermon? Stephen told about how that his uh, father, that he lived as a, in fact, Stephen said he lived as an idolatrist. And God called him out, revealed himself to him, that he was one God, and he obeyed him. And how he put him in, there in that land. And here was this Gentile, you might say, telling the Jews all about their history. And when the Apostle Paul heard that, who this scholar who had been brought up at the feet of Gomelus, the greatest teacher. And Paul was really, he says himself, that he was superior to all the theologians of his own day. And so here's this little theologian sit there, this bigot. Here's all of this. And he says, I'm going to get rid of this Gentile stuff. These people are trying to change the way we do religion. Talking about this Jesus. And so, listen to what it said about him. Here, listen at it carefully. It says uh, that uh, this guy here, it says, Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution of the church in Jerusalem, and he was the one leading it. And all of the Christians were scattered abroad throughout all of that region. Verse 3, look what it says. It says, as for Saul, who 
who's the head man, as for Saul, he made hawkers of the church. He would enter into the houses, everywhere he would find them. He would hail men and women, commit them to prison. He was getting rid of that Gentile influence upon the Jewish religion. And then, look what it says here as we uh, go on. And it says here in verse 1 of chapter 9, it says, And saw, yes, breathing out, cursing against God's people. Everywhere he was going, he was saying, We got to get rid of these people. Look what it says here. Breathing out, threatening, and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He went into the high priest, and he demanded of the high priest that the high priest would give him a letter to the synagogues. And wherever he found Gentiles in the synagogue, wherever he found people talking about this Jesus and this kind of influence that Stephen's is talking about, wherever I find them at, I'm going to take them and I'm going to bring them back to Jerusalem. And there in the streets, we're going to stone them again like we stoned Stephen. We're going to bring this heresy to an end. And so he got his letter. And look what it says here. And as he journeyed, verse 3, and as he journeyed, this mad man, this mad man, with all his energy, with all his fire, with all his determinism, you are looking here at a Idi Amin. You are looking here at a Adolf Hitler. You are looking here at a Sadat. You are looking here at a wicked man. He's on his way. And he feels his strength. He feels his power. He feels the emotion of the fact that the Jews are with him. They have already got rid of this Jesus. And now we're going to get rid of, stamp out the rest of this stuff. And wherever I find them, I'm going to stamp them out. And so on his road, look what it says here. As he journeyed, he came near the master. Man, he's feeling good. He's feeling good. He gets near the master. And he got near the master. Suddenly, there shone around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice. And listen to this voice. This voice says, Saw, Saw, I love you. I love you. I love you. Why you don't love me? I love you. Why are you fighting against me? Why are you getting so mean against me? I love you. Now I want you to know that that's the message that we have. And that message to the world, to the wretched people of the world, is this. I love you. I love you. I love you. Why you don't love me? Who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus. The only way to fall in love with God is through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has made God visible and knowable. We can now know God. We can know God because Jesus Christ. We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with our own infirmity, but was made like that we are, yet without sin. Now we can come boldly to him because he has been like us. He know our needs, and we can call upon him. He said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus whom you persecute. And then laying there in the dust, broken, broken, Absolutely broken in the sand. He says, I surrender. I surrender. Lord, what would you have me to do? Listen to what God says to him. You feel find this in the 26th chapter. He said, I've called you to send you far away to the Gentiles, the very folk you're killing. The very folks you're killing. I want you to know that reconciliation is not a byproduct. I'm almost getting sick of all of this tacking reconciliation onto the church. Reconciliation is the work of the church. 
God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. It's unfortunate that white folks set up a bigot religion. That's unfortunate. It's unfortunate we as black folks bought the fact that we can have such things as a black church and an Asian church and a Hispanic church and a Jewish church. and all. That's heresy. Jesus Christ came into the world to reconcile black and white, Jew and Gentile together into one body and to show what the power of his love could do so that the world could know that we was Christian. We have accepted this stuff. We've accepted it. We've accepted it. It shouldn't be. God has no respect to person. And so what he's doing here is reconciling this bigot Jew to the Gentile. Fact of business, he's going to do more than that. He's going to call this wild man to go back, back to the people that he's killing. He's going to send them out. After he gets through training them, he's going to send them out. He said, I've called you. I've called you to carry this gospel far away to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. And Paul could say, in the end of his life, he could say, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. We need a vision. We need a vision. He gave Paul a vision for the church. He gave Paul a vision for the indigenous church. Paul went out on the front edge of society, and Paul preached the gospel. He would stay out there with those people for two months, six months, form a church in that community, and then would pick out elders and put them in charge. Then he would send Timothy and Titus along to guide them, but he raised up indigenous churches out there in those neighborhoods. Then he told Timothy, as he was teaching Timothy in 2 Timothy, he said, Timothy, that's what you've heard of me among many witnesses, that commit unto faithful men and women who shall be able to teach others also. And the whole idea is faithfulness. Faithfulness. We have created a church of emotion, not a church of faithful people. Uh, faith should produce faithfulness. You are not fit to be a leader in the church unless you are proved faithful. You have to set people around out for a few weeks, a few months, and look and see whether or not they're going to be faithful. And it's in response to that faithfulness, we give them leadership. That's the first requirement of being a leader in the church today. And so he said, find faithful people. Set those faithful people over people. And he established those indigenous churches in the society. He had a vision. Let me conclude with this. Paul had a vision for establishing the church. That's what we need today is a vision for going into the urban communities and establishing holistic churches. Churches that have health centers, churches that have tutoring programs, churches that put getting people jobs, churches that training folks, churches that's holistic, churches concerned about empowering people within the neighborhood. We need to go and establish those kind of churches in the community. Then we need to learn how to join together the whole church, this suburbia church, that has lived with this Harris for so long, that, that ran away from the urban situation. We need to go out there and love them and partner with them and get them to join with us as we plant churches in these neighborhoods and in these communities. Well, without a vision, the people perish. Let me share with you my vision for the remainder of my life. You need a vision that's lifelong. You need a vision that you're going to die with. You, you need a vision that carry you on to the end. I'm 68, and I've been in this Christian community development for 40 years. And now, whatever time the Lord give me, I want to stay faithful to the vision that he has given me. And that vision is empowering people, believing in inherited dignity of the poor, Believing that we can come along beside of them and nurture them like somebody came along beside that young man last night and nurtured him and how he has grown and how he can speak to us. We need a vision to go out and to do that with people. Establish these solid congregations that can nurture and disciple people within the neighborhood and within the community. I was talking with some people that, from Willow Creek the other morning. 
one of the leaders that are here in our conference. They got a vision for helping to establish, and I'm going up to spend some days with them, going up, and they got this association of these hundreds of churches, and we want to we go out there and help them uh, to, to, to move a little bit beyond uh, just seeker-friendly, but move out there to those folks who are non-friendly and, and learn how to reach them uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ and bring them into their home groups and disciple them and, and to make those home study groups look like the neighborhood and the community in which people live. We got to break down these racial barriers that we have set up in our society. We have a vision for that. But the big vision I have, let me tell you what happened. Y'all was here last night and when Spencer died, it was a, it was a hit. Vera May had raised Spencer to replace me in the family. We had raised Spencer to be the head of the tribe when I was gone. And uh, when I would go away from home, and I was away a lot, Spencer sat in my seat. All of my children looked up to Spencer. They looked up to Spencer. Then Spencer died, and it was a hit on us. It was a hit on Vera May. Just a few weeks ago, I went into her room about 3 o'clock in the morning because I had, I had felt like that, you know, he was my son too. And everybody was sort of ignoring me. I wasn't doing nothing right. I didn't do the funeral right. I didn't do nothing right. Uh, I, I put together a scholarship fund for the kids. I didn't do that right. I put together an educational scholarship. I didn't do that right. You, you know, and so everybody was mad with me. And the father have to take that. That's the idea of being a Christian. If you can't take suffering, you don't understand what it means to be a Christian. But, but I was getting to break down a little bit, saying that he was my son, too. You know, people are recognizing he's my son, too. He was my firstborn, too. But that's the father's fault. He got to take the hit. But I was breaking a little bit on that. And then uh, one night about 3 o'clock in the morning, I Chris and them had decided that they were going to sell the property. They was going to split. They talked about that last night. They all split up. And they was going their own separate ways. And we were blessing them as they go on their own separate ways. The vision that they had had didn't have any vision. It was no lifetime vision. It was a vision for them being together as long as they could stay together. Uh, they didn't have a vision for life. They had a vision for being together. That's the danger of community. Here's some of my community people here. That's the danger of community. The danger of community, it will become self-serving. It will just serve you. you see, that's the danger of community. And then when community break up, all your vision is gone. You have to do We need a vision bigger than our community. We need a vision bigger than ourselves. We need a vision that carries gospel to the end of the world. We need a vision that we can commit ourselves to for life. That's the kind of vision we need. And so I woke up that morning, and what woke me up was I heard these vans and these trucks and these people talking loud outside. It seemed like they were my friends. It seemed like they were people from Iowa. It seemed like they were the people who I met in CCDA. I could hear their voices. I could hear you, people like you guys from Chicago. I could hear you talking, and y'all was trying to get in. And I got up out of my bed, it was so strong, I got up out of my bed, and I went to the window, looking to see them so I could let the people in, and it was dark, nobody was there. I went back to the bed, and I woke Vera May up. I said, honey, God has called us, or called me, and us together, because we do everything together. I won't do nothing until I get her to agree. I wake up, I, I just, and she don't she agree, I don't do it. And when she agrees, then I know we're going to do it. And, and so I, I went to the room, and, and I woke up. And I said, uh, I said, honey, they got the land for sale. Uh, they want a hundred and some thousand dollars for it. They got a couple other houses for sale. They want so many thousand dollars for that. And I said, honey, let's buy this center. Let's buy this land, and let's embody Spencer's vision. Let's carry out what he wanted to do. What Spencer wanted to do was to build a training center where people could come there and learn about how to train young people, 
how to do Christian community development. He had a vision for white and black and Jew and Gentile living together. And he wanted to spread that vision from Mississippi out to the world. If he could spread it from Mississippi out to the world, it would be more believable. And so he had this vision. And I said to Vera Mae, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And I said, all of our friends is going to come and help us. I heard them this morning. They are coming. They want to come. And Vera Mae said, but the first thing, where are you going to get the money? <laughs> you know, now she always asks me those questions. She always spoil. <laughs> she always spoil my vision with reality, she thought. <laughs> She always trying to bring a vision back down to earth. Well, I want to keep my vision up there. And, and, and so she thought, I said, huh, look here. Do you remember, you remember that I bought this little insurance policy when we was having all these children? I said, I bought this insurance policy, so if I got killed or something, you would have some money. It's one of these kind of policies as you get older that it depreciates, but while you're young, it pays a lot. And it is almost an eagle itself out. And I said, honey, we'll sell that policy. And I said, also, you know, we started back in the early 70s. We started buying these, uh, they call them IRAs or something like that, that you get to, as a hedge for your income tax. And so we started buying those, buying her one and me one every year. And those things had multiplied. And that was going to be our retirement. And I said, honey, we don't live past retirement. I said, I, 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 I said, uh, I said, let's, Let's, uh, let's, let's sell those things and let's buy. And so the next day I was on the phone calling my, calling my agent and he was telling me what to do and we got rid of those stuff. We bought that stuff. We paid cash for it out of our own pocket. And we said now what we want to do, we want to get CCDA people. We want you to bring your young people there. We're going to get us a carpenter, an engineer, an architect to be there on the job, to do the main stuff. And I envision CC Day people coming, and we building a first class study center. I'm, we got this old house they lived in, the Antioch house. It's over 100 years old. That's gonna be the pearl of our community. When you guys walk in there, your eyes are gonna pop open. It's gonna be absolutely not, because nobody don't expect nothing nice in the ghetto. The, you know, the, all they expect is roaches and rats in, in a ghetto. And, and so we're going to make this place beautiful. And then we're going to build an a, a, a eight-basket basketball court where we can have clinics there. We can bring the basketball players there, the kids. We're going we're gonna to build a, a playground for the kids to learn to play ball and play it right. Soccer field. And then over in the corner, we're going to put a senior citizen's where those old folks can have some life so we can bring the old folks back together. They can tutor and work with the children. We're going to build that center there. And we are asking you, what I'm asking you to do, let's do it, CCDA. Let's do it together. Let's build it. Let's build a model of what God can do. Let's dedicate it. We want to, the very man and I want to dedicate it. We want to leave something for the next generation that's coming. All of us are so busy with all these credit cards, so stretched out today. What are we leaving for the next generation? We want to leave something in the honor of my son, Spencer. He's the one who led me to Jesus Christ. Without him leading me to Christ, I might not have been here. I want to leave this center as a place where young folks from Mississippi, first of all, can be raised up. And then where well, you can bring your young folks down. The first time, I want you to bring them down. Bring your young groups down. We want to clear this land off. We want to take down all those fences. We want to build uh, walkways in there in the park. It is beautiful. We want to build an amphitheater. We want to build a, uh, uh, a conference center. Ain't no conference center in no urban community. Ain't no black conference center in this country. We need to build something to affirm people's dignity where other folks can come and see that we can do something. But most of all, we can do it together. We can do it together. This can be a center for reconciliation and development. That's what we want to do. That's our goal. That's the vision. Let me conclude. Let me conclude. My time is gone because John Thomas is going to come now and talk to us for a few minutes. 
You know, Paul had another vision, and this is the conclusion. Paul had another vision, and that was a, that was a unique vision too, because Paul had wanted to go into Asia. He had wanted to go further into Africa, and the Holy Spirit had forbidden him to go into those places. And then one night, he got a vision, and that vision was for Europe. That vision was for Europe. He saw a man in a vision over in Macedonia, and this man said, come over into Macedonia and help us. And God, through the Apostle Paul, carried the gospel to Europe. And you white folks are here civilized because the Apostle Paul carried that gospel there. I'm asking you now, I'm saying to you now, all of us together, I'm saying, I have a vision. And I had a vision in the night, and that vision was this. Y'all, come over to Macedonia. Won't this be something? Come over to Macedonia. And let's anchor a center that can train young people in urban development. And our goal is, Gordon and I have a goal, once we establish this center, we have a next goal is to establish one in Chicago. And we would like to see, by the time we are gone, maybe by the time God is gone, I might go a little faster, uh, by the time God is gone, I would like to see these kind of centers, model centers, in every major city in the United States. And so I'm seeing this here as a model. So I'm pleading with y'all to come over and to help us. That's my message for this morning.